Hello, welcome. I'm Dr. Leslie Korn, and thanks for joining me today for this talk about kicking the sugar habit and how I worked using integrative medicine and nutrition for the treatment of trauma with a particular client. Some of you were here last week, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and you're gonna find out some of the answers that I posed as questions last week and challenges with our uh, client. And I'm also going to take you one step further with some results. So let's get going. And thanks again to Rachel, our intrepid facilitator here for helping me out with the slide deck. All right, here's the name of my new certification course. You will earn up to 33 CEs for this course. And it's a go at your own pace. And if you previously took the mental health certification, uh, and we've got over 28,000 graduates right now from that online course, you will love this. It's an extension. It's more in depth. It takes you into new areas, particularly with trauma and complex trauma. And as a psychotherapist who's worked in the field for over 40 years, like you, most of our clients have histories of trauma. And I was very lucky to be introduced to yoga and meditation very early in my life and studied nutrition and herbal medicine and then body work. And it was body work that allowed me to be privileged and honored to hear the stories of chronic stress and pain body discomfort and emotional discomfort. That took me into the study of psychology and psychotherapy. So I've been very honored to have an integrated practice for so many years. And this is the kind of practice I know you're interested in because in my experience, when I was doing just straight psychotherapy, I was only getting about 50% of the results because we needed to include the body. We needed to include the spirit. We needed to include the engagement of what are we fueling our bodies with? What are we, how are we exercising? And do we know we're doing the exact right exercises? How do we engage in adherence and self-care when the essence of trauma and complex trauma is learned helplessness? So that's why I'm passionate about sharing these approaches with you. And today is really part two from last week. So feel free to go back and pick up on that video. It'll be available for you. And really understand, particularly at this time of year, that sugar is the drug of choice. And literally, it's so disruptive to mood and so causative of an inflammatory process in the body. And it's often hidden in foods. And so many of our clients aren't aware of the effects of refined sugar on their physical health. And if like me, you're working with a lot of trauma survivors, you're also working with a lot of chronic pain, joint stiffness, fibromyalgia. And so very gentle psychoeducation around this issue is something I teach in this course and something I wanna share with you today with this lovely client that I had and worked with for a number of years. So let's get going and do a return to our case. I've highlighted a few of the um, notes that Miriam, this lovely, lovely client uh, shared with me. And I'll just highlight them now because I want to invite you into how I think when I'm listening to someone's story. She shared that she was alcohol sober for four years. Right away, that made me think, hmm, she's already come to me saying that she's addicted to sugar. And that makes sense because alcohol is a sugar substance. And so we very commonly see the struggle with our clients who become sober, that they're still addicted to a substance. It may be better in that sense of it's not altering their consciousness and triggering anger and rage, even though we know sugar can do some of that, but they're still physiologically addicted to sugar. And the reason this is so important is that it makes it harder to stay sober. 
And so when I'm working with someone that's got triggers and challenges, it's a biological trigger to keep using sugar. And we know at the wonderful step meetings and AA meetings, often coffee and sugar is served, uh, even in our very best recovery institutes. So this is where I work at the macro level with our agencies and with our residency programs, but also individually, just educating about the craving of sugar is biological. It is not emotional, even though we might want to self-medicate a little bit with sugar. um, It's mostly biologically driven. And the important piece about that is it reduces the shame. So the other thing I paid attention to is Miriam said she had a history of complex trauma, anxiety and depression, chronic pain, depression, chronic pain, or inflammatory processes that are made worse by sugar. Uh, She had joint pain, headaches, fatigue, and fatigue is very common in trauma. Not only is it, as we discussed, uh, depression of the adrenal hormones, but sugar can raise the energy, you expend it, and then it drops. So it leads to this kind of chronic fatigue that doesn't quit. The other thing that really uh, was obvious to me was the hint when she said she wakes up in the middle of the night for an hour or two. And I want to give you a little hint here about what that means when you do a sleep history with someone. And I encourage you to do that. It's one of the first things I do with my trauma patients because if we can improve sleep, we improve a whole host of uh, feeling states and mood states as well as physiological function. And so oftentimes waking up in the middle of the night, it's called insomnia type two, signifies that blood sugar, natural blood sugar, which supports our brain function, has dropped precipitously putting the body into an alarm state, which means the body wakes up, the brain wakes up and says, help, I don't have enough glucose to get through the night. And how that manifests is we wake up in the middle of the night, can't get back to sleep. And so there's a very easy way to test for this and even fix this. I always encourage someone who describes this to eat a little snack right before going to bed. If it's 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., eat something like maybe two ounces of chicken, uh, two ounces, if you're vegetarian, a couple of ounces of beans, or maybe a piece of cheese and a gluten-free cracker, maybe a slice or two of apple, maybe even half a boiled egg, something that's going to stabilize your blood sugar. And I found this works almost miraculously with people waking up in the night. In the course, I go into a lot of other things like how hormones uh, can affect that at all stages of life. But this is one simple, easy fix that no matter where you practice, you can make this suggestion. Hey, you know, if you're not sleeping through the night, Let's just make sure that you've got enough blood glucose to get you through the night. How about trying a little snack with a carbohydrate, a little bit of protein, and see how that works. So all of this comes to me just by taking this history and this assessment. Now, Miriam is this wonderful client, and I know we all have these clients. They've done a lot of work on their trauma. They have really made progress. And Miriam is enjoying bike rides. She's got a stable relationship, but she's still plagued with mood lability and she just doesn't feel great in her life. And that's why I wanna help her optimize her mood states. She loves cooking and that's always a good sign because that lets me know, hey Miriam, let's talk about food and how mood follows food. Are you up for some cooking? And she said, yes, she was. And so she said she wanted to integrate mind and body and make the connections between her emotional states and her physical states. And that's the nature of our work in integrative medicine and nutrition is really making those psychic and somatic connections and giving our clients tools step-by-step to improve their health. She wanted to feel more energy, less fatigue, sleep better and have less pain. And because we've done so much, we, as a post-trauma therapist, I integrate a feminist therapy. I use DBT, CBT selectively. 
I use all kinds of methods, even narrative therapies, to establish that kind of uh, self-regulation, processing, meaning-making, and then moving forward into the wounded healer state of helping others and having a satisfying career. But for her, for Miriam, the missing piece was how she was nourishing her body. And that was the focus of our work. She said, I crave sugar. I can't stop it. So I did a food mood diary with her. And this is a very simple diary where I could look at what she was eating. And it was laden with lots of sugar and carbs and sweets and candies. And I said, oh, Miriam, we've got our work together and I'm going to walk you through finding substitutes. And we talked about that last week, that we don't have to give up sugar. Well, we have to give up sugar, but we don't have to give up sweetness because that is part of our palate. We are meant to enjoy some sweetness and nature has given us those sweets, but nature did not give us refined sugar. Nature gave us that beautiful sugar cane. So after this assessment, I had a good clear idea of where I wanted to go. And then it was up to me sharing some of these ideas with Miriam. And last week I shared with you some of the dietary changes. Now let's look at some of our deeper dive into the other options to help her and her sugar cravings. Next slide, please. Remember, I reviewed a little bit about the Brainbow Blueprint last week, and this is the core of our course. I walk you through every aspect of this blueprint for integrative medicine and nutrition. And for our purposes today, since we've got just a brief period of time, and I want to focus on the culinary and herbal choices, we're going to stay on this right side of this Brainbow Blueprint. But just to let you know, each one of these aspects is an aspect of integrative approaches that I work with with clients. And I have handouts in which they actually define what's of interest to them after I explain to them what's involved, and then we prioritize it together. And it's really such an um, enriching and enjoyable part of our work together. Next slide. So what are some of the integrative methods that you saw on the right side of that slide? The first piece was the bioindividuality. And I wanted to really tailor to Miriam what I thought was important was to make the connection between alcohol and sugar. And indeed, she had grown up as a latchkey kid, had never really had food security, um, made the best that she could, had boxes of cereal. So she'd really grown up living off of refined foods and sugary products. So her body didn't know anything else. And what I said to her basically is, Miriam, I promise you, if you can find a way to eliminate sugar, and I'm going to help you do that with some better quality foods, I promise you, your mood's going to feel better. Your depression is going to get better. Your anxiety and your sleep is going to improve. I couldn't predict just how much, but I've seen 50, 60, 70 percent mood stability just improving, reduction of depression improving just as a result of eliminating these um, really toxic foods. Uh, they're foods that are called um, not only endocrine disruptors for the et neural endocrine system, but they trigger uh, reactivity among the neurotransmitters in the brain. And so one of the things Miriam said to me during our initial conversation, she said, oh, I could easily use some Diet Pepsi uh, instead of straight Pepsi. I said, oh, Miriam, you know, glutamate is going to be even worse for you. I'd rather you even eat sugar than have those uh, false and synthetic sugars. They're really uh, reactive to the GABA receptors in the brain, and they can really destabilize your mood. So how about if I give you a great alternative and teach you how to make your own uh, fizzy water or soda, as we say on the East Coast, those of our uh, East Coasters with us today. And so I gave her a recipe called a lime ricky, in which we used uh, frozen uh, blueberries and frozen 
raspberries with fresh lime and some mineral water. And the neat thing about mineral water is it has lots of brain supporting minerals in it. And even some of the mineral waters have lithium in it, natural mineral lithium, which stabilizes mood. So we had a blast during that session, brainstorming. And then I said to her, what appeals to you? And this really engages adherence, empowerment, and connection and rapport. So then we looked at biorhythms. And you recall that her biorhythms were a little off if she was waking up in the middle of the night and then waking up groggy in the morning and tired as many trauma survivors do. So this is where I educated her about her glucose dropping during sleep. And I gave her that hint to try a, um, a little meal, a mini meal, two or three ounces at night before sleep. And you know, that did the trick. It helped her sleep through the night. So we began the process of stabilizing her blood glucose with lots of proteins and fats and started to eliminate and literally detox from these refined sugars and carbohydrates. And we um, I asked her to continue to pay attention because above all, our work as psychotherapists is about awareness and making the connections. And so this is really just the next step. We're helping our clients make the connections between how they're nourishing themselves. And I use that broadly, not just with what they're eating and drinking, but broadly nourishing themselves. And then how do they feel? Do you feel like falling asleep after a uh, spaghetti and Chef Boyardee or pizza in the middle of the day? Uh, or do you feel rare and to go after a nice uh, protein meal with uh, maybe some sweet potatoes and butter and salt in the middle of the day? So this is a uh, part of our work around um, our biorhythms and then our assessment. So I worked with her to identify her sugar sources. And I gave you this handout last week. We looked at refined and complex and it was very gentle psycho ed. And this is another important thing. You don't need to be a nutritionist to do this work. This is basic self care. We don't need an RD degree to say, hey, you're anxious, you're not sleeping. Maybe you should drink less than six cups of coffee a day. Do you know what that's doing to you? So in the course, I teach you the whole spectrum from psychoed to a much deeper dive where either you choose to learn more or collaborate. And I always encourage collaboration and, and practice building as a result. Now, Miriam suggested she loved nature. She loved being out in nature. And I use that as a tool and as a metaphor for exploring natural sugars and talking about our love for nature and how we love being at the ocean or in the forest or, or running by the sea and the gifts that nature gives us to balance our mood and enhance our well-being. And so that's where I emphasized well, let's identify what nature gives us. Honeybees give us honey. The agave plant gives us dark agave, rich in minerals. The maple tree gives us maple syrup. The stevia plant gives us uh, stevia. So nature gives us natural sweeteners. And this was part of our work together, uh, was uh, really embracing how can I heal myself using natural means and support my own natural self? And Miriam really jumped on board with that and just loved that. Now, Miriam had a very good, stable relationship. And when she ran into a rough patch with her partner, she invited her in to do some process work together. And so at one point I said to Miriam, does your partner like to cook? She said, not so much, but she loves my cooking. I said, would your partner be willing to travel this path with you about improving your diet? She said, absolutely, but I think I'd like her to come in and have you explain to her what we're doing. I said, anytime you want. And so then we did a couple session together and really explored maybe some of the little areas of tension or challenge uh, that they might embrace uh, during these change processes. And what it does and what I found clinically, and I'm sure you do too, is when we bring in the partner, 
when we bring in the family, we get much better adherence. We get rid of the so-called identified patient. And we say, this is a family affair. This is a community affair. Okay, next. Oh, um, I, I had another note here uh, because Miriam, that's okay, Rachel. Um, Miriam shared her love and I, and I use a, a canine in my therapy practice. So she knew, of course, I appreciated the healing power of dogs. And so we then were able to do a little divergence. Um, she fed her dog really good, delicious food. I said, do you feed your dog sugar? Oh no, I would never do that. I said, then you better feed yourself as well as you feed your dog. And so we had a good laugh about that. And um, so he was part of the whole community family affair too. Okay, next slide. So we also looked at culinary. I was sharing tips and recipes and gave her some idea of substitutes after we went through that substitution list that I shared with you last week. She loved hot chocolate. You can make a good hot chocolate and sweeten it naturally. And we know that chocolate is very anti-inflammatory. I shared with her about that. It's rich in polyphenols. It's very rich in stimulating uh, dopamine in the brain. So it helps focus. It improves mood. So chocolate is really a good brain food for trauma recovery, but not if you add sugar to it. So that was a little tweak we made. She liked a little bit of coffee every day. And as long as that didn't trigger anxiety, I said that was fine. Generally, coffee's best in the morning to keep with our rhythms. And so I gave her a mocha recipe with coconut fat, so good for the brain. And she just jumped right on board because these were options that were intellectually stimulating to her, um, but also delicious to her taste buds. I educated, as I shared with you earlier, that protein and fats are some of the best foods to stabilize mood. Fibers slow the uptake of sugar because it's the rapid uptake of that refined sugar that triggers oh my, I can do anything. It can trigger almost a mania, but then it drops us down as quickly. And speaking of that, whenever I have a trauma survivor, and I'm sure you've seen this too, a misdiagnosis of bipolar, I always work with them to eliminate these refined sugars before I settle on a diagnosis of bipolar, because it's often a hidden sugar addiction that's creating such a mood lability. And we also see a lot of misdiagnosis of what's really complex trauma um, and saying it's bipolar. So um, that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. I love to use the baked roots, uh, the steamed roots, because those are nature's natural sweetness as well. There's nothing like a sweet potato or a sweet potato souffle. And when people say, oh, I don't have a lot of time to cook, I said, get 10 sweet potatoes, throw them into the oven, cook them slowly for 90 minutes, bring out all that sweetness, and then store them in the fridge, have them hot, heat them up, add a little butter, uh, do whatever you need to, add a little cream to really satisfy that on-the-go sweet tooth need for a little boost of energy. Eggs, nature's perfect protein, and then of course fresh juices. And I, I shared with her about even making some fresh juices. And she planned she was going to ask for a holiday gift from her partner for a juicer. Okay, supplements. I reviewed supplements with you last week. I want to share with you why they're so good. For for um, Miriam, I suggested these primary supplements to reach her goal: B vitamins. These are where we start. These are the vitamins that help neurological function. They calm us down. Um, they reduce pain. Uh, the, some of the B vitamins like niacinamide and biotin specifically target sugar cravings. So I always begin with a good quality B vitamin supplement, and they even make them with chromium. And I mentioned last week that chromium is our go-to mineral 
for reducing the uptake of sugar and balancing out mood and cravings. Remember the cravings are biological, they're not emotional. We may go for something when we feel stress, but stress has a biological response that it's creating that's triggering the cravings. So it becomes a vicious circle. And again, this reduces the shame people carry around cravings, vitamin C, and again, niacinamide, even as an additional dose. Now in the course, I walk you step by step through dosing and through indications and contraindications. And as I say, many people, uh, many counselors, social workers, psychologists say, but I don't have a background in nutrition. That's okay. We're not always going to be prescribing surgery, but we might know if a client comes to us and we say, you better consult with a surgeon about this if you've broken your arm. Or, you know, a client might say, I don't know whether I should be doing uh, an SSRI. We're not going to prescribe it, but we may refer. And so we're going to be on the first line of answering our clients' questions who say, I don't really want to do a pharmaceutical or I want to get off these pharmaceuticals. I've gained 30 pounds and I have no libido. Can you help me? You're going to say yes, because you know there are answers out there in nutritional therapies and integrative therapies. You're going to know a lot of them after taking this course, but you may also decide to collaborate with an expert. And that's going to be your option. And it's always our option to what's in our scope, what's in our competency, and then who are we going to collaborate with. And the same thing with herbal medicine. Did you know that anybody in the United States can practice herbal therapy? What I say is great. Now, do you know enough to do it? And so in the course, I teach you how to use herbal medicine for the treatment of trauma. Now, in the case of Miriam, I thought she would enjoy something called golden milk. And if you're not familiar with this, I encourage you to, and I've given you a link to my blog where I write about golden milk as an alternative to NSAIDs. It's a delicious Ayurvedic Indian drink that's made up of turmeric and some natural sweets that reduces anxiety, reduces pain, and it's a yummy drink to boot and you can have it hot or cold. Now, last week, I also mentioned berberine. That may be a new term for you. This is an evidence-based, scientifically proven extract from some herbs. For example, you've heard of golden seal or Oregon grapefruit. It has been shown to reduce blood glucose and reduce cravings. And we use it in diabetes type two, we use it in all kinds of sugar cravings, or if you're on the verge of elevated blood glucose. So that's another thing I suggested to her to use. And uh, she wasn't on any other medications, but if she had been, I would have said, Miriam, uh, give a release and let me talk with your prescriber. And let's just make sure that she knows that I'm recommending these things and let's get her sign off on it. Uh, and I, I do that quite routinely when I'm working with people on medications because you wanna know what those interactions are. And I teach you how to find that out. Now, licorice root tea. Uh, because she was having a lot of pain, uh, had a lot of history of stress, licorice root tea is perhaps our go-to to balance out her biorhythms, to reduce inflammation. And those of you who've had licorice, I don't mean the candy, I mean the, the herb, know that it's got a natural sweetness to it. And so I wanted to give her some options so that maybe some days of the week she might have golden milk in the morning and some days she might have some licorice root tea. And I give you a whole video on how to make this and how to make a delicious drink and detox drink in the morning. And I shared this with her as well. And she really jumped on board and felt so much better. There's a lot of good research on licorice root. Um, did you know that we use it? It's been shown in the lab and in uh, clinical uh, trials to reduce the herpes virus as well. It's very antiviral. It's a good thing to be using uh, for any kind of chronic viruses. And we know that people with trauma 
uh, histories have a vulnerability to Epstein-Barr, um, hepatitis, and other viruses. So then finally, I wanted to talk with Miriam about how do you feel about this plan and what do you see as the obstacles? Because I want to walk this path with you. I want to support you. I don't want to push you to go too quickly. I want you to have the support you need. So let's plan for plateaus. Let's plan for falling off the horse, as it were. And that's what we did in our normal therapeutic conversation. So if she had trouble, if she felt challenged, if she felt triggered, um, we were able to process that, process it, that psychotherapeutically. And so this is how you get a sense of it's very easy to integrate this into psychoeducation as a part of the toolkit that we're sharing with clients and educating them about. Next slide. Oh, I guess we've reached the end of what I have to share about Miriam today. And I think we've got some questions. Okay, I see. Oh, thanks, Rachel. I've often seen that depression and a lack of energy motivation to spend time in the kitchen crafting healthy meals go hand in hand. What do you suggest for giving clients the nudge they need? I'd love to see you create a culinary mental health class. Now, um, we can do this via Zoom these days or even as we move towards getting together. I do this individually and I dress, address learned helplessness because as you know, part and parcel of depression and trauma, particularly in the early stages is motivation, getting up and go. So I educate about that and teach about what that is and then give simple step-by-step -step instructions or suggestions and then get an agreement. I, this is where I integrate motivational interviewing for culinary health and trauma recovery. I suggest, for example, um, what would it feel like to get a crock pot or make it easy, maybe a blender? So we focus in on what what's the first thing you'd like to try and how would you like to do it? And so then we have a back and forth brainstorming. And oftentimes it's time, uh, oftentimes it is motivation. And so how about once a week instead of fast food, uh, throw something in the crock pot. What's a recipe you'd like to try? And then I give them a recipe or I might recommend a food uh, that they might enjoy. This is where we might integrate the partner uh, or the spouse or other family members. Um, this is where, as I began by saying, I love doing groups for this reason. Who doesn't love going to um, a cooking group where you're doing process work uh, around just this question and then you get to cook together and end up with a delicious meal together. And I've done that in a variety of ways. We might begin with a crock pot class and so at the beginning of the group, I show people how to throw everything into the crock pot. And then that crock pot cooks for four hours while we're doing yoga for trauma, meditation for trauma, skin brushing, process work around motivation. And then the meal is ready. And then we finish off that uh, day, that morning class on a Saturday or Sunday or an afternoon with a delicious meal together. I find group really supports overcoming some of those obstacles. Thank you for that wonderful question. I have a lot of clients who depend on caffeine to get them through the day. What healthy alternatives to soda do you suggest? You're absolutely right. I have a saying, um, caffeine or coffee is a drug, not a beverage. Use it carefully like a drug. And this is again where I educate. Caffeine has some good benefits. It's a gentle mood booster. It enhances focus because it supports dopamine, but too much of it sends us over the edge with anxiety and insomnia and even with gastric problems. So I have a wonderful coffee substitute I love called Ticino, T-E-C-C-I-N-O. And the reason I love it is it has a product called Capomo or Ramon seed in it. 
And we know it's very rich in amino acids and it makes you feel happy. And so that's what I do is I help people reduce their caffeine intake. And after all, it's an addiction too. So I have a whole protocol for reducing it slowly by decreasing the caffeine and slowly doing a decaffeinated coffee or some kind of decaffeinated beverage. And remember, these power drinks we know through evidence now that they are a gateway drug to alcohol abuse in teens so we really need to get them off of these caffeinated beverages so i have a whole protocol for substituting coffees remember i mentioned that mocha smoothie that's where you have a little bit of coffee and a little bit of chocolate and so then you eliminate the caffeine and you start using a decaf I've got herbs like rhodiola that I use with clients. I've got lots of methods for uh, changing out these um, caffeinated drinks, whether they're hot or cold. And I've got lots of recipes in uh, my books, uh, as well as the course, like the um, raspberry lime Ricky I just shared with you. Next question. Oh, I love your questions, everybody. You're making me hungry. Can we have your mocha recipe? You sure can. I We're going to give you a handout at the end of this meeting. And Rachel, I'm not sure what the recipe is in it, but you know what I'll do? I will send you um, that mocha recipe and we'll figure out a way to get that to you. I might even have that mocha. Oh, I've got that mocha recipe. If you search in my blogs, it's called a mocha matcha smoothie. Okay, so now you've got two blog, uh, two blogs to search for some yummy recipes. And that's great. Download this free report. That's super. Okay, next question. If we've got some more time, I'm happy to spend it. What's the right pace to help clients make dietary changes? How do we help them make it sustainable, even if they don't feel like starting better? Uh, start feeling better immediately. This is such a rich question. There's so much to this. So let me see if I can give you a few little, little tips. Um, it's not unlike anything we do with clients about making changes in their lives. I want to get a sense of what they're ready for. And I do this with motivational interviewing and share some of these methods um, in the course with you. Um, I want to understand what you're ready for. I don't want to push, but one of the cues that I'll give to people is that I'll say, um, this might be beneficial for you. Are you ready for this? Or if you're not ready for this, let's revisit this next month, or let's revisit this um, in two months. How about that? So we might discuss some change, but we might recognize that I'm not ready for this right now. And I'll say, that's great. How about if we look for this change next month? Um, how do we help them make it sustainable in all change? And I encourage us all to look at our, um, our own change. We are our own wounded healers going through our own healing. Just think how it is to get ourselves to make these changes. And that insight, I think, can help us with the insight with our clients. And people are going to fall off the horse. That's okay. We're going to get back on the horse. And we're going to make the connections between how we feel. Because in trauma, there's often so much numbness and dissociation and disconnect. There's often a disconnect between how I'm feeding myself and how it makes me feel. And so that's our work in psychotherapy is fine tuning that connection, those feeling states, those sensations. And what we're doing is we're bringing in dietary practices and food and a whole range of self-care activities that are natural, that complement this. And just one final thing, cause I'm getting the hook uh, and our time is gonna be up for today. I always uh, teach people, this is a, a metaphor that I use, that nature works slowly but surely, and most often without side effects. If you think about a tree growing, those re roots take time to grow, settle into the ground, but not much will topple it over. 
And so often people come to this approach because they've had bad reactions with um, side effects from drugs for that hammer on the brain that says, hurry up and change. It's not sustainable. It's overwhelming. But people want the immediate fix. And so, so much of our work is educating people that change that's sustainable is slow, but it's sure, and it's without the side effects. So I'm always educating about the long picture and cultivating patience through a mindful approach. I'm so thrilled to have spent this time with you today. I'm delighted uh, by your questions. They're the same kinds of questions I field in our course, and um, I just love being in touch with you. So thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> for this invitation. And with that, I will say goodbye, farewell, adios until next time. Thank you, everyone.